So what is this transformation? What I want to do this morning, I want to um, firstly talk through what I think that transformation might look like, what the future of shared services in the digital age might look like, give you a summary of, of a vision that I outlined last year, and then I want to have a look at how organisations are actually doing in the real world. And I'm going to do that by looking at the, the latest global shared services survey that Deloitte does every couple of years. So first of all, I want to talk through the framework. I call it the, uh, the three cornerstones. There are three areas. Three, three areas to think of. The first area is what I call the engine room, your core operations. This is where all the transaction processing is done. This is where shared services started. When it started in, in, in Europe, in sort of Dublin in 95 with Whirlpool, it was transaction processing they started with. Secondly, I'm going to talk about the front end, if you like, how you interact with your customers. And the key here is the customer experience, how they experience your services, processes, and so forth. And the third area is about value creation, how you add value to the organization beyond just taking out the cost of transactional processing. So firstly, the engine room. I, I, each of these areas, I'm going to ask you a question or two, set you a challenge, perhaps. So the engine room, my question for you, very simple question. Does anybody still here have humans processing transactions. Does anybody, anybody still have humans? <laughs> you do? Hey, I, a few months ago we had the 50th anniversary of man landing on the moon and you've still got humans processing transactions? I, I mean surely isn't the technology there that this should be fully automated? Why do you still have people involved in these mundane day-to-day -day activities? Now the reason is well understood. The reason is that you've got a massive lack of standardization in your systems, in your processes, in your data. You've got mass fragmentation. Your systems don't talk to each other. They don't interface with each other. And as a result of all of that, you've got exceptions. And it's exceptions that take all the time for humans. But here's the key. Here's what you need to think about when it comes to the engine room. Humans, people, should not be processing transactions and resolving exceptions. They should be automating transaction processing and eliminating the root cause of exceptions. That's got to be the way forward for the engine room. It should be lights out. And that's the objective. You've got to say, why aren't we lights out? Why aren't we lights out? How can we basically have no one doing transaction processing? So that's service delivery. How can we automate to eliminate exceptions and manual effort? The second area. As I said, the front end, the customer experience. Now, you all know what customer experience should look like. You all know because every time you use something like Uber or Netflix or Amazon, you have this great customer experience. Think about the last time you used Amazon. You can use it anywhere, 24-7, through any device. It's personalized information and data for you. It's completely lights out. It's completely intuitive. You've never had a lesson on how to use Amazon and yet you're an expert. Now compare that to your corporate services and processes. Compare that to how the users of your shared services organization experience your services. Who here thinks they're as good as Amazon? Who here passes the Amazon test? What? No one. But Amazon's been doing it like this for eight years. What are you waiting for? Now, Again, the reasons people aren't there is largely to do with legacy, where they've come from. But that's got to be the ambition, that's got to be the goal, because that's the hurdle right now. I personally get really annoyed if I have to use systems that aren't as good as Amazon, because I know what it looks like, I know what it could look like. And that, that tension is there. So I think you need to think about what are you going to do to get there, and what you need to do to get there is to start thinking about the customer experience, front and centre of any redesign process. Start using a design thinking approach. When we look at redesigning processes now, historically we looked at sort of end-to-end -end processes using a sort of business process redesign approach. That's fine, but you now need to add a couple of things. One, you need to think about the digital capabilities that, that are out there. Think about how you're going to use robotics and other cognitive technologies. And secondly, you've got to start with a customer experience and then think about the service and then think about the underlying process, not the other way around. We call it cognitive service design, cognitive services design. If you don't do that, you have to revisit to add cognitive, revisit to add the customer experience. It doesn't work. So that's the 
That's the second area, the customer experience. The second part of my vision for shared services in a digital era. era. And the third area is value creation. Think about it. If your vision was just get lights out service delivery, get a great digital customer experience like Amazon, if that was the sum of your vision, what would people be doing in your shared service organization? Would you need people in your shared service organization? If you actually did what I'm saying you should do, you really shouldn't. So if you want, on the assumptions that you want people in shared services, they need to be adding value beyond taking out the cost of transaction processing. That's what value creation is about. Let me give you a few examples of what you should be thinking about here. So firstly, in your traditional functions, finance, HR, IT, procurement, so forth, in those traditional functions, think about how you can move up the value chain beyond transactional, moving into business partnering. Think about all those management accountants in the field, what they do. A lot of what they do is data management, taking information, putting it into Excel spreadsheets, formatting it, analyzing it, producing commentaries. A lot of that data management can be done in shared services. By the way, I see people taking pictures of the slides. We will have all of the slides, pretty much all of the slides that you see today and tomorrow will be available. There are one or two speakers who keep one or two slides back because there's confidential information, but I'd say 95% will be available within days of the, of the event. Um, so that, yeah, that's one area. Move up the value chain in those traditional functions. A second opportunity is outside of those traditional finance HR areas, what about looking at industry-specific processes? So if you're in retail, how can you support merchandising? If you're in energy and utilities, what about supporting the oil exploration process? Huge opportunities there. A third area, analytics. Think about it. If you're a multifunctional global business services organization, you have visibility and access to all of the information in the organization, pretty much. You have people data, finance data, customer, supplier, and so forth. Do something with this tremendous access. At the very least, you should be the supplier of, of single version of the truth data for decision making. Beyond that, you can play a far bigger role by becoming a COE for analytics and decision making. Again, all of the things I'm talking about, organizations are doing and you'll hear about over the next two days. A fourth area, digital transformation. For many organizations, RPA, robotic process automation, hits the organization first in the shared service center because it's really well suited to the transactional processing stuff that is done there. So for many organizations, the experience is built first in shared services. And from RPA, people then tend to start looking at other cognitive tools, AI tools, natural language understanding, natural language generation, chatbots, data mining, and so forth. Rather than doing this digital transformation for just for yourselves in shared services, why not be a catalyst for organization-wide digital transformation? Again, leading shared service organizations are doing just this. So the challenge there is how can you add value to the organization beyond cost reduction? For me, this is an interesting, useful framework to assess how you're doing against other organizations out there. So I hope that's uh, of interest. What I'm going to do now is take a look at the, uh, what's happening in the real world. So I'm going to turn to our, our last survey that's been produced in the last few months, uh, and this will be available through the, uh, the conference website. You'll be able to download the survey. I'm just going to look at a few interesting highlights. So it's a global survey, 379 respondents, nine industries from all around the world, um, on average, about three shared service centers per organization. As you can see, 50% of the respondents are new to the survey this year. So I will be doing prior year comparisons. Some of those comparisons could be thrown out by the fact that there are so many new participants this year. But because we have such a high number of participants, that shouldn't really be that relevant. So we asked a question about how many functions are performed in shared services. And as you can see, the average was two or three. Some organizations, 2% had 10 or more functions, more than 10 functions in shared services. The interesting thing here was that there was a very significant increase in the number of organizations that had three or more functions in their shared services. That's more than doubled in the last six years, only 20% in 2013. It's now 2019. So that's a very significant move. As I said, shared services have been around for, what, 25 years in Europe in the last six years phenomenal growth in the number of functions being put into shared services. 
So we were interested to find out which functions, which processes were being performed in those shared services or knowledge-based COEs. I don't think numbers one, two, and three are a surprise here. They've been the same pretty much since we started doing this survey 20 years ago. Number one, it's finance. Number two, HR. Number three, IT. I think the interesting thing, the surprising thing perhaps, is the growth, significant growth, in the customer and sales-facing activities and processes. So you'll see customer service contact centers, that's gone up from 34 to 40%. Sales and marketing, that's gone up from 15 to 23%. Uh, actually, uh, it, it reminds me, last year we had uh, Steve Rudderham, who at the time was the GBS leader at Kellogg's, and he was saying one of his specific strategies was to try to take administrative work away from their sales team so those sales teams could spend more time with their customers selling and increasing revenue. So you can see that this is something that's borne out in, in the survey. So we're interested to find out about governance. And the question we ask here, do the resources within your organization report to a global head of all their respective functions? Now, this, this touches on a, a, big, a big question, a big decision you need to make as a shared services leader. Is Are you going to go for a functional model where you leave shared services in the functions, so HR does its own thing, finance does its own thing, and there's really no linkage, no overarching management structure? That's what I call functional shared services. Or are you going to go for a GBS owner model? This is where you have a multifunctional shared services organization. You have an overarching management layer. And everyone in that shared services organization, everyone in that GBS organization, reports to a single GBS leader. So that person, he or she, is the owner of that entire team. And then there's a sort of a hybrid, if you like, which is the, the GBS landlord model. This is where you have the overarching management, you have a GBS leader, but the resources in shared services still report back to the functions, HR, IT, and so forth. The GBS leader is effectively a landlord providing the common infrastructure, providing the location, maybe some continuous improvement, maybe some onboarding support, and so forth, but the people report back. So those are the primarily the three alternatives and options, and that's what we were getting to with this. This effectively is saying, do you have a GBS owner model? And what you can see here, 2019, the outer circle, is 50%, 50 of the people we asked, the 379 organizations, had a GBS owner model. What's interesting is this is slightly down from two years ago. It was 52% then. So maybe we're seeing peak GBS owner model. The companies that are going to get there, maybe they've got there. We then asked... Do you consider your collection of shared services and outsourcing to be part of a GBS organization or not? So presumably, are you one of the GBS, owner or landlord, or are you still shared services in the functions? The response here shows that the larger the organization, the green is 2019, the larger the organization, the more likely they are to consider themselves as GBS. Presumably because the larger the organization, the more they can afford that GBS infrastructure, the management infrastructure, and also they're more likely to be international and complex and therefore greater need for a GBS organization. But again, you see that other than in the mid-tier, the number saying they're GBS has actually decreased somewhat from a couple of years ago. So we were then interested to find out those that didn't, and about 40%, Something like 40% of the respondents did not consider themselves a GBS. We were interested to find out if they had plans to shift to a multifunctional or GBS model, and if so, when. What we saw here is that just over half had no plans. In fact, only 13%, that's what, one in eight, had plans to do so in the next couple of years. So this suggests to me that, that maybe this phenomenal growth in the last half dozen years, we're seeing it sort of plateau and we've, we've reached a peak. Now, now, my view here is that it's clear that the advantages of moving to the GBS owner model are that you can, because you have ownership of the resource, you can get them to share more for a start. They can share common infrastructure, ways of working, service desk, help desk, and so forth. Uh, you can also potentially reorganize them on end-to-end -end process lines. So you can break down the functions within the GBS organization and organize people along processes and get more of an end-to-end -end process perspective. So the benefits are clear. However, it's much tougher to do 
than the GBS landlord model. I, I, in the last three or four years, there have been at least half a dozen very high profile, blue chip multinationals who have tried to get to the owner model and who have given up. It hasn't worked. And, and one of the primary reasons is because it's far more threatening to the functional leaders if you're trying to set up a GBS owner model. If you think about it, what you're effectively saying is we're going to take 40, 50, 60 percent of people out of finance, out of HR, out of procurement, and rebadge them and put them into a new part of the organization. So the functional leaders are going to feel potentially a lot more threatened by an owner model than a landlord model or just leaving in the functions. I think this is one of the key reasons, although it's worth going and getting if you can, you've really got to have the support of the functional leaders and you've really got to have CEO ownership and drive for it to work. In fact, I would say that being a GBS owner, probably second to being a British Prime Minister, is one of the most difficult jobs to hang on to. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's like maybe another three months for Boris at best. So, um, but it's a really, it's a tough gig. And there are many GBS owners here. You, you'll see, they're the ones with very grey hair or no hair. It's a very stressful job. So we then asked them, well, why haven't you? So we, we said, why, why aren't you planning to move to GBS? And the answers they gave, interesting. The top one, 52%, not ready for end-to-end -end process execution. I would argue, I, I get this, that they're saying, you know, we're happy with the functions. We're just not mature enough to really organise around end-to-end -end processes. I get that, but on the other hand, there are a lot of other benefits from moving to GBS. So I talked about, you know, if you look at Shell, they have a really fantastic landlord model, uh, and they, they share a lot across the functions. Common infrastructure management is what the GBS leader used to be called 15 years ago, because they share the common locations and all of the local finance, HR, IT, uh, onboarding, recruitment, and so forth. So there's a lot you can share, even if you don't organize around end-to-end. -end. And the second, the second answer there was, um, as I mentioned, lack of leadership support. You must have the CEO completely on board and supportive, and, and then you must have the, uh, the functional leaders on board. Okay, so we then turn to the future, and how do organizations expect things to change over the next three to five years? I think the top two answers, these don't surprise me. Use of robotics, we'll come back to that. That is a, that's the, the if you like, the, the stepping stone, the launch pad into other digital technologies is RPA. It's the easiest to, to get hold of, to understand, and start playing around with. Um, secondly, the focus on the digital experience. That is, is trying to create um, an Amazon-like customer experience. So that's the attempt to pass the Amazon test. That's not a surprise. The third one's a surprise. Focus on continuous improvement. You know, if shared services have been around for, what, 35 years globally, 25 years in Europe, CI, continuous improvement, is not new. It's not some newfangled technology that's just been launched a few years ago. So why the added interest? My theory here is that in the last few years, as people have tried to unwrap, un un unwrap the robots and get them to work on the processes, they've realized it's very difficult if you've got processes that aren't standardized, that are completely fragmented and are broken. You know, if you've got 50 ways of doing something, which one is it you automate? So I think as a result of this, there's renewed focus on processes and on continuous improvement as the way of standardizing and sorting out and stabilizing those processes. The other thing that's perhaps slightly um, surprising here is the last one. Uh, only 4% thought there'd be an increase, a significant increase in outsourcing. Uh, maybe we're reaching peak BPO. Certainly, um, the BPOs, the outsource providers, are having to reinvent themselves. It's no longer good enough just to be a provider of cheaper bums on seats near shore or offshore in India. That's a, that's a table stake, but it's not good enough. What they need to be able to do is significantly transform the organizations they work with. The organizations are looking at them to really be catalysts for digital transformation. And you'll see the contracts that have been written up now have very significant productivity improvements assuming there's going to be a lot of digital transformation. Um, so, so the BPO, uh, it'd be interesting to see what happens over the next two or three years. Their share prices suggest that it's a, still a very, very good market, but that right now I don't see significant growth overall. So talking about continuous improvement, one of the ways you make sure CI happens is to have global process ownership and or regional process ownership. These people often own the CI. So we're interested to find out whether organizations had 
global process owners and RPOs, regional process owners. And as you can see, along with sort of GBS, the larger the organisation, the more likely, the more likely it is that they have process ownership in place. Presumably because, again, they can, the bigger organisations can inf afford the infrastructure and have a greater need for it, given their size, multinational nature and, and complexity. So we're interested to find out what they do. What are their roles? And for me, there are four key roles, which I think is borne out by this slide. The four key roles of the global process owner. Firstly, the lighthouse role, to look out externally and see what best practice is that they can take into the organisation. Secondly, the implementation role, to implement that best practice across the organisation globally. Thirdly, the standardisation role, to keep those processes standard on an ongoing basis. And fourthly, continuous improvement, to make sure they're continuously improved. Now, the challenge that GPOs face when they're trying to do this is that you've got local managers and team leaders who own the resource, typically, who often say, no, nah, I don't like that process. We've got a better way of doing things here in Italy, France, Japan, Singapore. You know, we've got local ways of doing things. They don't get it globally. And there's this dispute between the need for global standardization and the need for local efficiency and we know what's best. So what some organizations did to overcome this was to say, okay, let's have all of that local resource report directly to the global process owner. That way, he or she controls resources and can make things happen and will win that battle to get global standardization. To an extent, that worked. However, what happened, the unintended consequence of that, was that they were so focused in day-to-day -day activities and issues, resolving the things that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis, that they didn't play their lighthouse role looking out for best practice and the implementation role. So what the levers that most organizations use now to make sure that the global process ownership works, I, I guess are twofold. One, put people in the right place in the organization, and two, make sure they're the right people. So again, I think back to last year with Steve, Steve Rudderham, who was a GBS leader at Kellogg's, and he talked about the, uh, the fact that he had seven GPOs. I don't know why I'm doing that, that's five. Seven GPOs. <laughs> And they all reported to him, so they were senior in the GBS organization, and they also sat on their respective functional leadership teams. So the hire to retire GPO sat on the HR leadership team. And also that, that person who was running hire to retire was previously the head of HR in the US. He wasn't just somebody who had a bit of time, yeah, you're, you're GPO now. No, it was a very senior person that had credibility and weight in the organization. So very important things there. And, and certainly, process ownership is something we're going to be talking a lot more about over the next couple of days. So let's look at uh, the digital agenda. Um, we asked this question. Look, 90% or so of people responding thought that increasing digital capabilities was fundamental to achieving the, their uh, objectives. Only 3% disagreed with that statement. The digital dinosaurs. Any in, any in today? Any digital dinosaurs here? No? No? No, but they're, they're at the conference up the road. <laughs> the future of analog. <laughs> it's um, sponsored by Abacus Now. I don't know, it's an interesting company that you might want to look into. Um, yeah, so everybody's on the same page. This is important. So we, we asked them, what have you got in place right now? Either digital solutions or enablers. And, you know, the top... Few didn't surprise me. Cloud, I mean, it's just a better way of, of procuring and maintaining software. It makes more sense. And to be honest, you really don't have an option going forward in many cases. RPA, we'll come back to. Single instance ERP, this is absolutely, if you want to avoid that standardization chaos, single instance ERP is one of the best um, underlying enablers for that. I think the interesting thing here for me is only 16% were using AI in their shared service organization, only 11% other cognitive technologies. Now for me with RPA, RPA is far more powerful when you ally it with AI tools, more cognitive tools. We'll come back to that, but um, that's an interesting finding. So looking at RPA, I guess the good news here is that almost two thirds of organizations have at least one or more automations in place. The disappointing thing is that only 10% have more than a dozen automations. Now, we're working with some banks that have a 1,000 or more automations, so this is really just touching the surface. 
There's a massive opportunity still to industrialize, to scale up RPA. What's happening is that people are getting the bots, unwrapping them, realizing it's quite easy to, to automate a process, but then to scale up, it's much more difficult. Much more difficult. You need to have the relationship with IT sorted out because they're probably going to host it. You need to have a COE, a center of excellence, to make sure you don't think, do things differently across the organization. There are three big challenges and opportunities here. Organizations need to scale up because the benefits will be better if they're working at scale. They need to start thinking end-to-end. -end. Historically, what's been automated are small tasks rather than end-to-end -end processes. And they need to add intelligence to their automations, add AI tools like natural language understanding, natural language generation, chatbots, and so forth. Looking at the savings so far, again, 50% have got less than 10% because they haven't scaled, and it's at scale that you get the benefits. And going forward, it's a slightly better picture. People expecting, on average there, about 20% productivity improvement going forward. Uh, another issue about the savings is that because they haven't been automating end-to-end -end processes, it's often hard to take humans out when you're implementing robotics. And in fact, our latest report on RPA, which you'll get on the conference website, it, it's, um, it's called, I think it's called Reimagining the Organization, um, and it's all about working in the age of with. Our view is that it's with technology rather than being replaced by technology. The robots are, are augmenting and helping humans in processes. They're not replacing humans more often than not. So a big opportunity for for much more to be done. And you'll see here that we have, you know, we have the key RPA vendors here, and they're all talking along the same lines, scaling up end-to-end -end processes and adding intelligence. Okay, so the key takeaways, as I said, maybe we've reached pe peak GBS from this survey's results. Maybe also we're reaching peak BPO. They are reinventing themselves and transforming to say relevant. Digital transformation, only 3% of the dinosaurs, they're not here today. But progress is very slow. Very few have added AI, very few have scaled up. RPA, it's not the silver bullet. It's not giving the 20, 30, 40% that some people were talking about a few years ago, but it is a still a very useful and vital part of the toolkit. It links other technologies together to digitize your processes. Customer experience is now seen as a very important objective, but as we saw here, no one yet passes the Amazon test. People are starting to take a design thinking approach, but not enough. Improving analytics, similarly, people see it as a big opportunity. Very few have done much in this area. Interestingly, CI is seen as the thing to focus on for many, and I think that's because of the fragmentation and lack of standardization in the processes. And finally, GPOs and RPOs are seen as a way to ensure this continuous improvement is put in place and is successful. That's all for me for now. Thank you very much.